this is the uh, concluding section in, in the program this, uh, today. It's been a long program and um, been absolutely, absolutely riveting. More than riveting, it's been deeply moving, deeply moving, challenging to one's own thinking of, of, of oneself, one's relationship with, with the body, um, but deeper than that too, with ideas of identity, difference, who we are, and 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 how we express that in in the writing. Um, so this so our last two our the sessions this afternoon are um, Nkosanati Setole and Duncan Brown. I'm I'm not going to go into. Uh, biographical descriptions. I think both colleagues are, their work speak for themselves. And I think to their words this afternoon that they have to share for us will more than make up for my lack of a adequate biographical introduction. Um, it is my pleasure then to welcome and to introduce Professor Nkosanati Sitoli. Nkosanati, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Kopas. Thank you so much. And good afternoon, everyone. What I'm going to speak on, I call it reflecting on my uncle's second death. And <laughs> I realized that uh, another person might consider that it may be similar or works in a way like being born again, but it's not like that. It's not like dying again and being born again, but it, it, it has to do with an experience that is called, or a phenomenon that is known as the near-death experience. And if I may explain it a little bit, as I understand it, it's a situation where a person is considered, is pronounced dead. In the case of my uncle, it happened, it was a long time ago. My mother was still a young girl, but old enough to understand what was happening. So my uncle got sick and then the body, as we are talking about the body, stopped functioning. It stopped working. He didn't breathe. The blood was not flowing. So the people who were there pronounced him dead. And whatever was done to a person who had died was done to my uncle. He was covered in a blanket a candle was lit and, and he was laid against the wall. The only thing that did not happen, because at that time uh, they were not using mortuaries, so he was supposed to be buried the following day. But my grandfather, because he was a chief and my uncle was supposed to be a chief after him, at that time, my, my, my grandfather was a member of the Nazareth Church, Iban Dalama Nazareth. He was a follower of Shembe, and they believed that Shembe was a messenger of God. So what my grandfather did was, he said he was not going to bury my uncle. So according to him, he wasn't going to be buried the following day until he had gotten the weight from Shamba that he should bury him. Because what he did was he sent his younger brother to Shambe to report that my uncle has died, but he didn't want him to die. He didn't want him to, to leave or to go because he wanted him to be a chief after him. So back then they were using horses and my Grand uncle was given a horse, two horses actually, to ride to wherever Shembe was, which he did. So he spent the rest of the day, Saturday, going to where Shembe was. 
and he was only able to meet with Shembe the following day, very early in the morning, around eight. So he reached Shembe and he told him what, what had happened, what his brother had sent him uh, to report and to ask. So I'm going to finish the story but it's just an introduction. So my, 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 my uncle dies, but so he's lying there as a person who has died for about 24 hours, around nine in the morning, but this is going to be explained later. But he wakes up, he's resurrected uh, the following day on Sunday. Now, I'm very grateful for this workshop, for this meeting, because this has been with me, because this is a story I was told uh, by my mother, like when I was very young, and I used it for my research when I was doing a mini thesis for, for an MA. I explored near-death experiences when I learned that, that actually this was called a near-death experience. And there were other people who had had experiences like this. And so in my research, I, I looked at 10 stories uh, from people who were related to, to the Shembe Church, to Iban Lalaman Azareta. But I also came across a book written by Moodley, Ray Moodley, called Life After Life, which was also documenting stories of people who had been considered dead and had taken spiritual journeys, if I may call it that, I called it that. And then well, I did my research and I wrote a thesis, which I wanted to do. And I just want to read something that I, 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 I said about this when I was doing the research because I'm trying to find a way to explore this in a different way than the way that I did, maybe not exactly like that. But let me just read what I stated about, about this story of my uncle and the other stories that I was documenting, that I was, uh, I was engaging with for my research. Chief Mfungelom Kunu's story is part of the body of stories of miracles and of miracles that circulate in the church and informs the members' beliefs about who Shembe is and about their own sense of identity. This story and others that I've written about here pose a serious challenge to me as an academic. The one similar to that Hilary Mantel was confronted with when she dealt with the life of an Ita Italian saint, Gemma Galgani, about whom she asserted that when you look at her strange life, you wonder what kind of language you can use to talk about her. Through which discipline will you approach her? So this is what I wrote, and I was trying to engage with this in, an, in, in academic terms, so to speak. But today I want to engage with this experience, not really worrying about the demands of the academy, but just talking about it as something that has always played a part in my formation as a person and in informing my spirituality. Sometimes I think this idea of not having a language to talk about something like this, either an illness or, or a disability or, or an experience like this. Sometimes it has to do with the audience because it's always easier for me in a different context when I'm not in the academy, when I'm not worried about the language that is acceptable to the academics that it's only then that I, 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 I think about Mantel and wondering what language I can use. So I remember that then in trying to find a language, 
uh, because back then, right now, when I think about this experience, I suppose what happened was, and, and, and I'm hoping maybe I'm misunderstanding the topic, but speaking of this mortal body, for me, and knowing this experience, it, it creates an impression that there is this mortal body, but there's this other thing. And, and back then I, I didn't use, I, I didn't use the word, maybe I use spiritual journey, but, but yeah, that's what I believe it is. But at the time, I remember I had to find quotes that will make this work better. I, I for instance, quoted uh, Belinda Pozzoli to qualify my studying of these nar narratives. And I said, I was studying these stories as unsurpassed sources for revealing the otherwise hidden forms of consciousness. And I also quoted Duncan because he had written about, I think there's a chapter on, on the hymns. And he, he, he said that uh, he's not interested in the truth claims of the, of the hymns. And I think that I said uh, I was not interested in the truth claims of, of, of the stories, but I think that I have always been, uh, and I am interested, and, and, and I'm, I'm trying away now, and I'm hoping that this topic allows for me to think about this in that way, not having to, to, to bring in Belinda Vopozoli's uh, nice ways and surpass sources for revealing the otherwise hidden forms of consciousness. And to say, reflecting on my uncle's second death i just when i was because that was what i wrote as the topic but i'm actually reflecting on the the, the the experience but being prompted by the fact that he was dying he he died in 2006 after i'd done my research so being part of the funeral being there when he was being buried and stuff, it, it took me back to the story that I was, I was told. So maybe if I return to the story, so uh, when my grand uncle arrived at Zondesega where Shembe was, he, Shembe, he told him what my uncle had, so my grandfather had told him to say that uh, his son has passed away, but he wanted him to come back because he wanted him to be a chief after him. And what Shambi did was, and, and I think that the, the, the word strange in strange life or strange experience in Mantel's quote, it keeps coming to me as I speak or whenever I think about this. But what Shembe did was he wrote a letter. It was a very short letter and he gave it to my grand uncle. He said, your brother's son is going to be resurrected. But remember this was Sunday. He had passed away on Saturday in the morning and my grand uncle spent the, the rest of the day traveling, riding a horse to where Shembe was, which was in, in Singa. So he said, Shembe said, your brother's son is going to be resurrected, but you must take this letter. And then he showed him a mountain, not very far from where they were. Sega, gave him a letter to say and said, take this letter and put it under a rock. And this is all. Oh, and then he said, if you arrive there before nine, your brother's son is going to come back. He's going to wake up. But if you arrive there after nine, then your brother's son is not going to to be resurrected. So my grand uncle then ran to this place 
and he took a rock and then put the letter under and he looked at the sun i think it was the 1940s they didn't have watches so he looked at the sun and and realized that it was before nine and then he started his journey back home but i just want to read them because like i said i was told this story many times by my mother it's part of the stories that she was telling us uh, as the stories from her side of the family but i had my uncle tell the story again but when i was doing research then i went to him and asked him to tell it again when i was recording so this is a translation of what i recorded as he was telling so i'm not going to go back to what i've said but it's, it's what he says when nine struck i was head moving i was head sneezing i was head coughing the time they they opened me i this person has woken up then my father went out and prayed because he knew that it was the lord who did this he prayed in the homestead and everybody was happy it was then that he went to the group of men who were waiting down in the forest our homestead was situated in the forest he went to record that no i thank you you can go now the child has woken up these were the people because it was sunday now so the people in the village the men had came with tools for digging the grave so this is what my aunt was referring to yeah so i too this site am traveling as my soul left at nine until nine in the evening until i woke up at nine in the morning i was traveling yes in my journey i don't know for sure but i know that i'm going to heaven in my journey i know that i'm going to heaven because i'm now dead i went for a while i saw this car my going here in green pastures there are beautiful pastures that some are sometimes spoken about even in the hymn book there is mention of green pastures i was traveling there as i was traveling there i saw this car wow here is this car what am i going to do because it's my homestead's car it has given birth and its elder is licking milk i looked around for a calf but i did not see it i looked around and waited and looked and the cow acted as if it did not know where the calf was i i waited now i really waited and looked at it closely it was fat the voice came and said oh you are now concerned about your homestead's cow from being none which was slaughtered for manazareta when they came to convert your father i was frightened it was as if i was asleep dreaming i went on my journey as i was traveling still on those green pastures not having seen anything else there appeared an eagle which appeared from the east this eagle thing approached me as if it was a plane as if it was a plane as it came to me it suddenly changed it stood on its feet and changed to become a human being it became father the lord of the pagamin the very same that my uncle was sent to at makunwin he arrived and landed in front of me i was so pleased to see the lord of the pagamin because indeed as i was traveling i had a feeling of happiness i had no problem the yunkosi came and asked me where are you going and i said i'm going to heaven then he said yes that is why i'm here your father has sent to me saying that he wants you to wake up because you are his only son father has said that to ingos because we were 11 boys the ingos knew but he just wanted me to be here he said because i've been dead for this long i was going to go there for three months he said some people who are resurrected from the dead go there forever and some become fools but you will 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 do you a favor because you will be a chief and listen to cases because your father will not live for long now now this is a narrative it's a part of it that i'm reading that i recorded from my uncle but uh 
it's, 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 it, it, when I think about it, when I read it, I, I can't help thinking about what Mantel was saying about not having a language, but the language is here and it, it does speak to me. And I think that my truth is, is, is that has made me to, 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 to believe at least that maybe there is something that I do have a body, but there's also something that carries on. So because I'm looking at the time here, I can just stop here and, and maybe we'll continue the discussion. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much, Nkosanati. Wow. There's something, there's a, almost a kind of a, a, a mythic element by that I don't mean, uh, I don't mean by that, that it doesn't exist, but that it has a deep, very elemental resonance to that. Thanks, I'll pick up and we'll, we'll, we'll um, return to it in the, uh, in the question, in the question session. Um, right, next, next, uh, next up is Duncan, Duncan Brown. Thanks, Corvus. Thanks. My piece is called Unmade, and it starts with a, an epigraph from Douglas Livingston. The crab, the clot, the muzzle, or the knife, patiently the nocturnal terrorism stalk. Even the brave know hardly of rest, aware a body's little but a glove stretched from metatarsals to neocortex on a stiffening frame. And then my piece starts with a very small piece of dialogue, Dr. Johansson. Mr. Brown, the scan has revealed clots in your lung and what looks like a hole in your heart. Me, oh fuck. I know the road from Somerset West to Stellenbosch well, so well that my muscle memory adjusts to each bump and curve in the road as I drive it. But every jarring, juddering lurch of the worn out leaf suspension of the minibus turned ambulance in which I'm being transported headfirst and staring at the roof panels leaves me wondering where we are on the route. The trip itself is unexpected. After months and months of treatment for asthma, bronchitis, nodules on my vocal cords, pneumonia, and endless rounds of tests, scans, x rays, antibiotics, cortisone and even Friars Balsam. I've been booked into Bergelichen Medic Clinic, day ward for a bronchoscopy. As my time for theater approaches, Dr. Johansson informs me that before anesthetizing me for the scope, he wants a CT scan. Bergelichen's CT scanner is apparently not working. So clad in a tiny hospital gown and the large blue panties apparently required for surgery, the nurses call them Victoria's secret panties, I'm shuttled in an ambulance to Stellenbosch. I just need to check, am I coming through clear on the audio? Yes, you are. Yes, yes, you are. Okay, good, thank you. The Stellenbosch staff are extremely kind. I'm pull, pumped full of contrast, scanned and dispatched back to Somerset West, all the time worrying that, by, that I may now have missed my theater slot. The contrast leaves me feeling rather nauseous, as does the fact that I've been nil per mouth since the previous night. As we navigate, navigate our way along Somerset West Main Street, close to our destination at Fergilechen, I hear the radio squawk and rapid fire, unintelligible dialogue follow. The staff at Stellenbosch CT unit injected me with too little contrast or the wrong contrast or medic mumbles. So we are to return to Stellenbosch for another scan, but not before he disembarks in Main Street and his place is taken by a large man who has evidently just eaten a large and pungent pie and who, for reasons I cannot fathom, feels the need to lean over me and share his and his family's psychological issues. The Stellenbosch staff are again friendly, as well as, ap as apologetic and somewhat evasive about what went, went wrong the first time. I'm injected with more contrast and fed back into the machine. Back at Somerset West, I seem for some reason to be wheeled into a different ward. Dr. Johansson appears and delivers his news. Clots, lungs, immediate treatment, 
possible hole in heart will have to hand me over to another doctor going away for the weekend will call to check on me in the days I phone I phone my wife. Time seems, seems alternately to speed up and slow down. I am alarmed and frightened. Is this it? Have I finally pushed myself too hard? Is my body giving in? The staff whirl around me. In my gown and surgical panties, I'm whisked off in a wheelchair to a waiting car. The wind lifts my gown, re revealing my pathetic near nakedness to all. We speed down the car park to the x-ray unit. From there, I'm carted off to the pulmonary ultrasound section. The rather chatty technician explains to me the wonders of his machine, with which it seems he is truly enamored, before turning his attention to the pulsing image on the screen. You do have a hole in your heart, he says, beginning an extensive process of measuring, probing, different angles, quantifying. But it's probably not much to worry about, he says eventually. He calls in the heart specialist from the office next door. I think you should be more worried about having clots in your lungs than what with, with what we can see of your heart, the specialist says brusquely before exiting the door through which he has just appeared. I sit waiting to be returned to the ward. What has always felt like a body intact with its covering of skin and space of air around it, rendering, rendering it coherent, rendering it, rendering it me, has now been injected, dosed, scanned, prodded, x-rayed, pronounced upon, found to be decisively unintact. A few hours ago, I left home as Duncan Brown. It seems now I am a problem in a wheelchair. The doctor to whom Dr. Johansson has delegated my treatment is on his cell phone in the foyer. Yeah, still waiting some other results, but confirmed that I'm treating this as a pulmonary embolism. Standard treatment for a PE. Yes, Clexane and Warfarin and Xarelto thereafter. Will do, he says. I have a rather fuzzy notion that an embolism is something to do with clotting the heart and dying. Definitely something that you do not want people mentioning in relation to you. Of one thing, however, I am certain. I will not be an embolism case in blue panties and a gown. With a change back into jeans and a sweatshirt, comes a visit from the doctor. His manner is polite and to the point. I have a pulmonary embolism, which they will treat with anticoagulants. The fact that the clots are already in my lungs is partly good news, as the danger of their causing a stroke has now likely passed. I need to be in hospital for a few days for close monitoring, he says, in case there are any adverse developments. He is professional and calm, and I gather I'm not the first patient is treated for a PE. Injected, dosed, and connected to a drip, I am now left to my own devices and thoughts. After such a whirl of activity, partial news and news, the severity of what is happening sinks in. What might post-embolism life be like? Will I ever be whole again? From my window, I can see the mountains I love so much. Will I be able to walk up there again? to fish for their beautiful trout? Have I let my wife and son down? How will I work? Why has my body betrayed me, this one who has been my constant intimate companion for the last 50 years, with whom I thought I was in close alliance? The book on my bedside table, a story of salmon, rivers and fishing, which I've been reading for the past few days, now seems to mock me with its impossibilities. The self-pity, of course, provokes its own retort. You feel sorry for yourself, but remember, you're a white middle-class person with very good medical aid in a private hospital surrounded by the best equipment and personnel. What about those for whom an understaffed, overrun rural state hospital is the best they can get? Yes, I know, I am pretty extremely privileged. So if it's any consolation, it never is. But anyway, is suffering always only comparative? I learned too the importance of being positive for those who love me. My wife is terrified, but I assure her that all will be well and that I'm on medication that will prevent any further clots happening. My son is told that under no circumstances must he pull out of the regatta he is sailing. I offer ironic deflection to my siblings. 
apparently I have more clots, clots than a trumpet rally, I say. I know too that I'm surrounded by prayer. The nursing staff are beyond kind. After my first night, I'm woken by the uproarious laughter of two colored nurses. One of them fills me in on the joke. It says as follows. Sarah goes for a job interview as a typist. The manager asks, Sarah, what is your erfaring van tuk? Nee, niks manier, she replies. Met my is dit net dagge en doosveen. It's 5 a.m. and the three of us are hysterical with laughter. Between the compassion, professionalism and humor of the nurses, the love and concern of my wife, and the doctor's assurance that my current regimen, current regimen of Texan and warfarin makes it nigh impossible for anything further to occur. I feel a sense of humanity return over the following days. I am scared of what limitations might face me in the future, but there is a future where by rights, rights there might not have been. The doctor returns after a couple of days to discuss my long-term prospects. When I ask him about the possible causes of my embolism, he offers what I've since learned is pretty much the standard response. He is immediately into the realm of the subjunctive. Um, may, might, could be, as well as the more prosaic prevarications, hard to say, not sure. In all of this, I'm wanting to know what happened so that I can avoid it happening again. Or maybe, more truthfully, I want to know how and why my body let me down so badly and when it may occur again. The doctor stresses rest, allowing the proper time to recover, only doing what your body tells you it can do, and a six month course of Xarelta, which is a more expensive but simpler to use and more humane anticoagulant than warfarin. And of course, regular checkups with Dr. Johansson. He also warns me to look out for symptoms, calf or leg swelling, lack of breath, and so on. Back at home, I'm breathless and weak, but determined to make a full recovery. The Zeralta the, the reg regimen is easy to manage, but I do find that the drug affects my balance and also that I bleed for a lot longer from even a minor scrape than I did in the past. My goal is a return to full life and the end of the Zeralta treatment, which seems to mark for me a time when I'm back to normal. As the months go by, a certain ebullience emerges. There is some cachet to having cheated death. You emerge from the surf having spotted a large great white 100 meters away. You jump just in time to avoid the cobra strike. You narrowly miss boarding the flight that crashes. You suffer an embolism. You tell these stories with some relish and a certain bluff bravado. The cachet and bravado are, of course, contingent on the fact that you did not end up in a grim, sordid battle with death. The shark was too far away. The cobra missed. You didn't actually take the flight. You survived the embolism. Four months later, one early evening, I'm standing at the stove making a bolognese sauce. I've been battling for the past few weeks with a slight cough that won't go away. I shift my weight from one leg to another and realize something else that has been bothering me all day. My jeans feel tighter over my right calf than my left. There is a moment of dreadful realization. I switch off the stove, put down the wooden spoon and say to my wife, I think I need to get to the emergency room. Initial blood test suggests what a scan the next day will confirm. I have another embolism. I'm immediately admitted with what turns out to be a fairly large spread pattern of clots in my left lung. Any bravado from the first episode is vanquished. I, vanquished. I feel unmade. Treatment is as it was the first time and I'm discharged with instructions that I must now take Zeralta for the rest of my life. It seems this case has been more severe than the first. I'm exhausted by the walk from the driveway when I'm taken home to our bedroom. My right calf, apparently the source of the clots, remains swollen for months, the result of damage to the valves in my veins. I'm given the assurance that Zeralto provides me a total cover against any possible clots in the future. But having been told after the first embolism that a recurrence was unlikely, 
my fears are not entirely allayed. I work at my recuperation and fitness and I'm able to return to work and some of my usual activities. But it seems something has changed. I see it in some of my colleagues, the dropping of eyes, a certain hesitance in the voice, a slight evasiveness of response. For some, it seems I have been marked by illness. I carry the sign of affliction. At the same time as I'm going through my own health issues, a friend is being treated for colon cancer. We find some affirmation in talking about our conditions. Echoing my own sense of being marked by disease, he speaks of colleagues treating him as intellectually or emotionally less, as having been diminished or made different by cancer. He tells me of a friend who was asked just before planning a visit to him in hospital, is it catchy? Revealing not just medical ignorance, I think, but perhaps more significantly, a deeply rooted fear of being afflicted by association. In many non-Western societies, illness, whether of mind or body, is seen as a mark of having been chosen, especially as regards spiritual power or the ability to heal. In many Western influenced societies, it seems it is frequently regarded as weakness, failure, lack of character. Some years later, I am now left with scarring in my lungs and intimate swelling, so intermittent swelling in my calves. I have returned to a full life, but there's a certain shade to its light, a slight unmooring of its fixities. There are strangely unexpected spin-offs. I never have to wait in the triage queue at hospitals and I'm given aisle seats on international flights whenever I request them. It seems mentions, mention of the words pulmonary embolism instills in everyone a cold fear that you might die on their watch. My medical history also leads to me to my being turned down for life insurance by one company and then being offered funeral cover by the same company the following day. Rather disturbingly, while at lunch at a restaurant, I notice someone who looks, at, looks vaguely familiar, eyeing me strangely. She steps out onto the balcony for a cigarette and strikes up a conversation with my wife, who's out there for the same reason. Curious, I join them and realize, I have by now recognized her, that she's the receptionist at Dr. Janssen's room. When you came to see doctor after your first embolism, I knew you would suffer another, she says, not unkindly but with no further explanation. Medical science has fixed me, but has not been able to answer my larger questions. For these, I turn not to Google or the Mayo Clinic, but to a slightly more unusual source, the dictionary. Pulmonary is relatively straightforward, meaning of, in, or affecting the lungs, and embolism on the face of it too, perhaps blockage of an artery or vein caused by a clot of blood, an air bubble, etc. But then track back the, etym the etymology of embolism from the late Greek embolos, meaning a peg, a stopper, anything pointed so as to be easily thrust in, or perhaps better from the early Greek emboline, meaning to th insert, throw, or throw in or invade. The M from N meaning in, and the bellow means to throw. So something thrown in unexpectedly, a spanner in the works, an intrusion that disrupts, a clot in the blood flow, the unwanted, unasked for intrusion of death into one's life. Veins can build a, a way around a blockage. Sins can, sinews can re-knit. Bone can regrow. The body can remake itself. I live on now, grab it with a sense of my, of my mortality, trusting love, risking liberty, working, praying, ever praying. Thank you. Thank you, Duncan. 
Thank you, Nkosanati. Sure. One is left with a kind of a sense from both of the presentations this afternoon. I'm left with a sense of, word that comes to my mind is a sense of wonder. It's a strange word perhaps to use, but um, the wondrous making of the body and the wondrous mm. unmaking of the body. How and why of the body, how and why it does its, its things that seem on one level to be not to have an explanation. Of course, yeah. Matthew, I wonder if I could kick off with you. Are you there? Okay. Yeah, um, yes, yes, yeah. Thanks, thanks. Um, there, was a, there was a moment in your narrative towards the end where um, the the fi there's a figure of a figure of an eagle. Uh, uh, an eagle appears, um, and then the eagle transforms mm. into into a, a human being. Um, and I wondered if you wouldn't mind. I mean, we heard earlier on in the morning when Warwick was talking about this man who, in his one sense, becomes a dog, but clearly is not a dog because he's still in human form, although he barks and growls and bites. He, his, form is, his form is human, but the, the nature is perhaps dog-like. And yet in this instance, the eagle is transformed fully into a human being who seems to be in some sense a, I need to, I can't re recall, but in some sense there was something divine behind this figure. I wonder if you wouldn't mind speaking further about that symbolism and the significance of that for you and for the story that you are researching. Uh, thank you, Kopas. <clears throat> In, in, in my other's narrative, what, what he says is, is, is that as he was traveling spiritually, so he saw something, say, he said, he it looked like an eagle, it could be an eagle or a plane. So he wasn't sure until it arrived and he realized that it was, in fact, uh, Shembe. It was the, the person, because he knew Shembe from his life because his father was a, a, a member of the church so they knew Shembe and he says that it, it became that so uh, uh, there may be that symbolism but I, I, I think that what he's saying is it's just that, that as he's walking he sees this thing it's flying so it could be an eagle it could be a plane and realizes that when it gets to him, that it becomes uh, this being, this person, this chamber that uh, his father had sent to. And then they have a conversation, like, where are you going? I'm going to heaven because I'm dead, he says that. <laughs> Strange, I think that here in Montana is right. <laughs> Fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. <clears throat> Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions? Any comments from anybody in the audience? Alana, I can see that you're dying to, to <laughs> jump in. Thanks, Alana. Okay, well, I'm dying to jump in for both stories. But um, in Kosanati, um, those many mysteries surrounding that original Shembe, Isaiah. Um, when I was at UKZM Press, I worked on two books on Shembe. Um, I don't know if you've read Liz Gunner's book. It, half of it is the laws of Shembe and half of it is testimonies um, from people who have personally had contact or witnessed him at the time. And they are just so moving. And there's definitely some kind of mystical resonance to him. It's not just people's superstitions or misbeliefs or it, it's something to do with the time he was located in um so so do you yourself have doubts about the veracity or do you allow for the fact that such miracles 
whether it's the force of belief, whether it's the force of um, the people themselves, you, you know, being in that state of belief, um, or whether it's it's an energy that comes from Shembe himself. What is your your take on it? <laughs> I, I, I was fearing a question like that, but uh, <clears throat> to be honest. Um, I think that it does help my understanding of this uh, narrative, this story, this experience, the, the, the fact that there is, in, in fact, a field. It's become a field, this near death experience, because it's happening, and there are people who are now uh, specializing in, in explaining this thing. So if you look at then the features, if you look at what is similar among them, it helps one, but I think that even though I don't want to talk about like like the force of Shemba per se, but what I can say because I'm a spiritual person, and this what this is what I was saying about this opportunity to speak as me rather than trying to be acceptable to the academy, acceptable to other people. Is that because I was told this by my own mother, okay? And I know that my mother, when this thing happened, my mother was there, and she had no reason to to to, to lie to me. You know that, as a person who's spiritual, I read the Bible and I say, if I can believe the Bible, then I cannot not believe this, okay? how you explain it like where it comes from if it's because my uncle knew but 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 the thing is there are other stories some of the stories that i dealt with there were people who were not members of the church before the experience would happen i'm just talking about this experience because it's from my you know my, my, it's like it's been with me all the time so that even my encounter with the world it, it, it does influence the way I see the world. I don't, I'm trying to avoid like saying the, 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 the power of Shambe and uh, as such, but I think that the experience itself, the fact that the boat is stopped functioning and then something has continued, that's mm -hmm. more important for me because that's, that's the near that experience. Mm -hmm. And, and, and there's so much that is unexplained in the world. And when we stop yes. allowing uh, 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 that, then we are poorer for it. And yeah, it was it was very interesting. Thank you so much. And and Duncan, I mean, I realize how much time <laughs> and ignorance has passed on my part that I had no idea of your experience. And you told your story beautifully. And I just, I just wondered, with your own body talking, does your body point you to any direction that says, this is why or when or where things started going wrong? Or is it still a, a, a mystery to you? Um, well, thanks, Ilana. Um, I think one of the reasons why I liked Kubis's phrase, even though he's not trying to disavow it, about, <laughs> about um, being both a landlord and a tenant in your body, is I think it, it, it kind of resonated with me because um, the experience of uh, an illness or whatever it might be you would call it like that is, is, is kind of unhoming uh, to you. To me, it, it was unhoming to me at the same time as I was very aware that this was home regardless. And uh, somewhere, bit, I, I, I struggle with any sense of causation. I was given none medically um, and I, I, you know, I, I haven't found any other and I'm entirely open to the spiritual. It's an integral part of my life, but I, I haven't found any made any connection of that kind. Thank um, yeah. mm. Thanks. I think um, Warwick, Warwick had a question. Warwick? 
Um, yeah, I, I'm just, well, to Duncan, I was just, when you were telling your story, I thought the, the, the crux of it was going to be inside that ambulance. And it's, it sounded horrific. And um, I've seen actually ambulances crash and they're pretty terrible drivers and stuff. So, I mean, it's, it's, it was a, f a phenomenal um, storytelling there. I love that. But I just wanted to ask, um, because in Sanati, what, um, I'm quite a big Hilary Mantle fan myself, and I wondered what book that was you, were, you mentioned. Um, it's quite curious. Thanks. Uh, it was... I can also answer that question if you want. It's actually from a... Oh, okay, please. If you want, yeah, it's it's okay. in a review. It's in a review article. Um, okay. I think it was in the London Review of Books, but I can get you the exact reference. Oh, okay. She was yeah. reviewing a, a book about Emma Galgani and some and other women saints. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thanks. Thank if, if I can just make a comment, I was I was very very struck in your talk because you were the first person in the presentations today, we spoke kind of explaining the sort of the interface between the body and the medical and the medical world. A lot of our discussions this morning have been talking about the body and, and the things that happen um, and, 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 uh, and what we've missed, what I've missed is that very, very, very crucial um, and very highly problematic interaction of, of, of the, what we would then call the patient, the ill person, the, the, with the so-called expert. And I'm really fascinated by that kind of the dialogue that takes place and the power dynamics that inevitably creep into that kind of relationship. And I wondered if there's anything else that you'd like to add about that and your yeah. your your feeling about it. Thanks, Kubis. I, that was a really important part of what I was trying to convey. And I, I, I there were I, I I wanted at no point to point particularly to point fingers in terms of the care I received, but it it was starkly evident to me how because of how quickly things happened. I went into hospitals hospital for what for what I thought was going to be a fairly routine bronchoscopy. Uh, and within two or three hours knew that I had potentially just survived uh, uh, something fatal. And I, and it was, you know, all stations um, it, within the hospital. Kind of. So you go very quickly from being a person with a name and, a, and that sort of intact sense of identity to being something that has, in a sense, given up all of those. Of those. Um, and it's only, I mean, you, when I, I try to, to narrate the experience of trying to recover those as well. But I think the, it, it was particularly because it was so, so quick that the experience was so dramatic for me. And I, I tried to make sure that it was quick in the narrative uh, as well. So, that, you know, a couple of paragraphs in your into, um, uh, into that experience. And um, Warwick, the, the, the ambulance ride is exactly where it all happens because at that point I realized something was really not potentially right. Um, and so it, it, perhaps it could have been allowed to resonate more than it does in the, in the piece, but it was, uh, it was the sort of vivid opening, memory, opening image for me of the experience. Thanks very much, Duncan. Um, we'll go to Helene, and then after Helene, Joanne. Well, Duncan, I'm just really struck by um, the image of you in the parking lot with those blue panties in the wind. <laughs> and um, I'm struck because it really captures that, the, the fragility of the whole, the vulnerability actually, but also as our relationship with mortality changes, and we no longer able to stay in the denial of it. Um, we have that enormous nakedness, which it feels like you capture so well, because of course the hospital, I don't know, I just thought it was really evocative, that particular image. Thank, thank you very much, Helen. I appreciate it. 
Joanne, you you have a question? Um, it's kind of a comment. I, I was struck by this issue of, of affliction by association, which which is something that I I think I can say I've experienced, and I think lo uh, quite a few of the people that I've uh, had conversations with have experienced as well uh, as people with disabilities. And um, it's it's I, I had a I had a sort of psychological explanation that that people people project their the, the fear of their own mortality onto <laughs> onto a body that's that's ill or disabled um, but but uh, you know I I certainly have experienced that sort of falling away of acquaintances and even f friends and I, I think that that's something about becoming disabled or maybe having a serious illness that that isn't it's not something nice to talk about so it isn't often it doesn't often come out it's it's a, it becomes a kind of a personal shame rather than than what it really is which is a sort of a disavowal of of conditions that are uncomfortable yeah. um Joanne, i think i mean when i i listened to the Jillian and anthea presenting earlier and how they talk their way through that, that set of experiences. Um, and then, as I mentioned, being able to talk myself to a friend who was going through not what I was going through, but something, you know, similarly, he was dealing with colon cancer. Um, and and you, your own sense that we need to talk about these things um, amongst ourselves if we're going to even think about how to articulate. You know, how to find a language, how to find a voice for them. Um, because th there is otherwise the tendency for, or there's a pr the pressure not to say anything, to be, to be silent um, or to be turned away. Yeah. Any, anybody, ah, um, Jill, Jill or, and or Anthea. <laughs> thanks, Corvus. Um, thanks, Joanne, for raising the um, the thought about shame, um, because it it seems to weirdly attach to the person different in the case of a disabled person or suffering in the case of an ill or wounded or insulted or harmed person. Um, and I think, I think it's one of the things we've actually got, to, we've got to think through, um, very carefully. Um, because I've, I've had an experience not, not as severe as Duncan's, but I came off an international flight and had something that was a little like a stroke, mm. um, in that I just, my, my arm went completely lame and a doctor reacted by putting me on warfarin for a year. And I had to do the constant checks, you know, to, um, uh, you know, to make sure I wasn't going to bleed out because warfarin is pretty hectic stuff. And, and a lot of what you've said, Duncan, now, um, uh, you know, just rings, rings so true. Um, but also, but also, as soon as Joanne said the word shame, I thought, oh my gosh, um, that weird sort of inability to talk, or to or to take the thing and put it outside of oneself, but also that you know it had a shameful aspect to it that I remember very powerfully now. Mm -hmm. But also that kind of I eventually um, I was working with a very very attuned, amazing specialist, you know, who's known for her, her ability to, um, what, what's that, um, uh, not dissect, what's the word doctors do? Diagnose. To, diagnose, yes. You know, known for her kind of capacity to diagnose things that sort of flummox other people. She could never properly diagnose what had happened to me. And I found myself in such a kind of state of, frustration around the lack of knowledge and the lack of clarity and the lack of a name 
for what was happening to me because, um, yeah, you know, and it taught it taught me something. It it, it taught me something quite, um, I suppose, shameful about you know medical science, in that medical science won't admit the limits of its own knowledge, um, and it was very clear to me that we we had no no clear sense. We didn't we did not know what had happened. We weren't sure that the medication I was on was very possibly not not right, you know. Um, but in the absence of a, a clear piece of knowledge, um, all sorts of things were being tried on me, my body, um, which, was, which was not at all comfortable. But there was something shameful about it as well, you know, about being in the state of not knowing, bearing it. Um, it, it felt like the body itself was failing. Um, you know, so, so it's just that kind of like agglomeration of those things. And, and of course, shame. And I, I just suddenly thought when Joanne mentioned shame, yeah. yes, this is in the mixture too, which makes yeah. it so very complex. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we'll go to Diana and then Einke. Diana. Okay, I just have some comments and some thoughts and, uh, you know, hearing, you know, Duncan's story, um, you know, we don't talk about illness and um, we're almost like taught and it's like, in, it's like assimilated within us, you know, it's like, almost like if you talk about your illness, you are, you know, you are complaining and you almost like playing a victim role, like you, you're moving into that victim role. Um, so to capture our illness and our experiences with illness and writing, I know for me, it's really difficult. And um, so I really, it's amazing to hear it and it to be captured so, so touchingly, it, it like really was very touching. And um, the more like when, when we have a physical illness, like something we can maybe see like a broken leg or, you know, um, whatever it's maybe a, because it's so visible, it's maybe a bit more, you know, acceptable in, in, in around us to actually like speak about this. Um, but the more the illness is maybe in the inside parts we can't see. Um, and, and this kind of, I, I think about, um, Kirsten's presentation earlier as well you know that, that like that rust we have inside us you know we don't speak about it all it's taboo it's like no matter what cultural background you come from it's like taboo it's no and then the second thought I have and um is medical doctors and I know um Dr. Sutli spoke earlier but you know I have a doctor in my family and a specialist and when you know I'm, I'm very close to this doctor and um, my sister and we speak about um, her work and she is dealing with death every day and she works in the ICU and deals with death daily and she's very removed from death so I, I just put a nose two together like here we are in a body experiencing you know um illness but we when we're going to get help um because doctors deal with this daily, how removed they are. And like, there's such a disconnect there. There's such a rupture there. Um, because for them, it's like, I, I see this every day. You know, I mean, some of the stories I hear from the doctor in my family, like, it like really affects me, traumatizes me. But um, for a brief period, obviously it's not happening to me or somebody I know closely, but it's traumatizing. And to be working with every day, how do, do doctors, medical doctors actually, um, you know, are they able to capture or, um, or express, you know, what they carry around with them dealing with this illness and death all the time? Yeah. yeah that's what I have to say. Thank you. Really good. Fascinating. Spot on points. Thank you. Thank you very much, Diana. Um, Anki, over to you. Anki. I have a. I, I'm 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 battling with the word shame, you know? 
uh, because the, the, the things that I experienced, I, I didn't want anyone to talk to me about it. I was scared for the banal vocabulary, for the pity, for the lie that they could understand how I feel or they are with me. So there's also that, that sometimes people don't speak because you, or, or because you, yeah, I, I don't want anyone to speak to me about what, what is happening. Because it's it's so um, it cuts so right through one that you 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 have to you yourself are battling to uh, yeah I, I, I think shame is is, is is sometimes too too so too and too easy uh, regarded as the only uh, that people are ashamed or embarrassed for your sake. It's also that you don't know how to speak about it and that it is impossible to really say, I feel you. Mm. I mean, uh... yeah. Can I re read something? It's, it's the, uh, there's another epigraph to this, this chapter, chapter, which I didn't bother to read, but it's about, it's about stress and shame. This is it. My boss, the DVC academic and I share a running joke. It emerged from a conversation in which we both acknowledged that to admit to health problems caused by stress was a career killer for those in leadership positions. I texted her from the hospital. I've been hospitalized with a pulmonary embolism. Don't worry, it's not stress. <laughs> I think, sorry, I'll come to you, Warwick. There's just two, uh, there's, with, there's a particular comment. I, I really think what, what I've also, what struck me about this afternoon's sessions too is actually the vital component of humor. I, I, I think we've missed it a lot in the discussions. I miss it in my own writing. And, and it's really vital to hear the way you're talking, Duncan. Um, it, it, humor doesn't remove, it actually helps, helps us to be able to approach these matters that as Anki quite rightly points out, we really have, we don't know, we are absolutely flawed. In all in all senses, um, I think was it Warwick? Did you want to? Yeah, ask yeah. I just just a th thinking of um, after Anki's um, discussion, um, sometimes one doesn't even actually have to talk about it. I, I at, for for a while I had a skin cancer thing. I had to go to Krutuska. I don't have a medical aid or anything, and the oncology department there is really amazing. It really, I mean, this was years ago. But we, we would, it was like the church of the ill. We, we'd all sit together, all these people who didn't have medical aids, and you'd have to wait there from seven in the morning till maybe three in the afternoon. And every time I went, there would be similar people. And there was this, you didn't speak about what you had, but you could see often. But there was this kind of um, camaraderie, I, I, I'd say, just of the sort of the church of the ill. I just thought of that now, just in terms of, when it's difficult to talk about, but you can actually just be in a way. Just thought. Thank you, Warwick. Um, I think Anton Anton had a question or comment. Uh, I was just thinking how often um, in the various talks today, um, which have been really moving, the, the, but the idea of failure and, and failing comes in as a medical kind of thing that we think even growing old and dying is also seen as a failure. Like, oh no, like, so if somebody um, survives, they're a fighter, like you've got to fight. And if you, you know, if somebody comes through something, it's like, oh yeah, they really fought and they won. So it's like a defeat. But just this, that, that sort of thing of, it's, it's a, you're failing if something goes wrong, not accepting in some way that this is really true and this is real, this is the absolute, this is what happens. This is, you know, the old age, death, dying. This is absolutely, you know, you know what I mean? It's like an avoidance of that. And this, and the medical model of um, hiding away or invisibility that we don't see dead bodies anymore or culturally it's not right. We don't, even old people, we don't really want to see them too much if they're too infirm or they make us feel awkward or, but there's something weird. And also the, the youth culture, just the fact that so much 
not just advertising, but we live in a very youthful sort of with the, the virtues that are promoted are energy and vigor and uh, those are the good things. So that's like winning and but anyway, I was just I just thought of something about this theme of of, of failing that's coming up a lot and, and seeing and seeing health issues as a kind of a you're doing something wrong or it's like somehow yeah you failed to do the right thing you failed to live healthy or it's your fault or there's a real burden of that I think of um, yeah not not winning in some way. Anton, I think is absolutely spot on. Thank you, really. That's really spot on comments. I think Stephen Stephen had Stephen. You wanted to uh, say something? Yeah, thank you very much. For me, um, I think one of the themes of the day has been identity. And since I think he made that comment, very insightful comment about, I have a body, therefore I am. It's come, it's come through in many presentations. And I think most strongly in Duncan's at the end, when he said, I, an hour ago, I was Duncan Brown. And it makes me think that when something happens to your body, it changes, your body changes and that changes you. So your body changes and that changes your identity. Um, is that always a bad thing? I mean, it seems like it is. We, we know who we are and then our body lets us down or does something weird and then we don't know who we are anymore. And I'm just wondering about that relationship between if we are our bodies and our body changes in ways we can't control, what does that do to our identity? I don't know if anybody would like to. Uh... Hi, Kobus, Elena. Uh, Helena. Helena? So I, I suppose it's been continuity. Just, I'm really left with the idea of that you tell your uncle's story as a proxy for your own spirituality um, because that's just one of the ways you do it. And how our relationship with all this, m m the mystery. That, that it's hard to be open about that relationship, however it plays itself out. Um, and that maybe it's the same, I mean, I think the shame thing's really interesting because it's a very private set of relationships, how we deal with our mortality, the mystery, our bodies. Um, and we try and talk about them because I think it's so important, but at the same time, there's a lot of shame potentially attached to all of it. Um, and I'm just uh, kind of, yeah, I'm left with a little bit of sadness around that, uh, notwithstanding the fact that humor is really necessary. Um, I'm noticing that. Yeah. Hey, Duncan? No, no, no. I wanted to make a comment about the course of Please. Thanks. I go ahead. Try to, to um, join up some dots here. It's not just about in course Marty's paper, but it's partly about what we're doing. Here. There was a, a, a group of academics some years ago who were in, having tea, and they were talking about what is the worst thing an academic could be, uh, humanities academics could be accused of, and the, they came to the conclusion that that naivety was the was the worst thing that could be could be thrown at an academic. Now. If you think about our dominant model, of the dominant model that we operate, and it's it's the model of critique for the most part. And I've, there's, I've just started reading. It's been published. It was published about seven years ago. Uh, Rita Felsky's book. I think it's called The Limits of Critique. But what she says is that that whole notion of going in with the hermeneutics of suspicion is what what we tend to foreground in in our academic work. And um, you know, that that becomes in a sense. Um, our mode of operation. But Quibus, you talked about, in relation to my paper and personalities about wonder and about being open to wonder, which is in a sense, one has to, to move beyond the model of simple critique, because if you're going to, to start to consider wonder, you're probably also potentially going to be risking skirting the, the naive, possibly. Um, so I, I'm really, I, I'm not, I, I'm not suggesting at all that one jettisons the kind of the notion of critique, but it it can become a kind of deadening thing where one is not then open to the kinds of languages that are that, I mean, in course, Nazi's piece is probably the most courageous one that we've had in this session in this so far because it's it, it's doing things that are not generally done within academia and 
are, you know, that's evident in the way he presented it. I mean, talking about having approached this through one set of languages and now, which kind of made safe, and now he's trying to find other languages which are not necessarily safe. Um, so, yeah. Whatever. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I know we had a hand up from Vuvanani. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Kobas. Yeah, what, what I've picked up from the presentations, uh, wonderful presentations, is the adaptability of our bodies to, you know, uh, to pain and all the hardships that we go through. Um, you know, the fact that our bodies can heal, can mend, you know, it's remarkable. But I think what remains a patient, it's memory. And I'm beginning to ask myself, how best can one heal memory, you know, uh, so that the memory of all the gruesome experiences, you know, is freed. Thank you. Thanks, Vonani. I feel these are very profound and very deep questions that are being raised this afternoon. And as in the nature of any of these workshops, it's not, it's not about trying to answer them because I think we realize that there are no definitive answers, but it is the fact that we are articulating them and pushing through, pushing through the, the, the monolithic qualities or the monolithic structures around us to try and find the nuances in discussion, the nuances in our understandings of these various issues. That is for me the most, the most, the most telling. Um, I think it's been a long, I don't know if there are any more comments. I think it's been a very long day. I, I'm, I'm tempted to call it to a close, but I don't want to do that uh, presumptuously or to cut off any interesting, stimulating discussion. So are there any, in so anybody who's bursting to, 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 to say something, because otherwise I think we should close off. My body is slightly bursting, but that's too... <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Anton. I like that, thank you. Um, absolutely, I hear you completely, yeah. Any, all right. Is that okay? I think we'll we'll um, close off for the uh, the afternoon. Thank you, thank you, really, thank you so 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 much for all of this. It's, it's been like food for the soul, um, and we will see each other at nine o'clock tomorrow morning. Enjoy.